Hello, everyone, again, and thank you for joining us as we are reading through Carl Rogers on Becoming a Person, a Therapist's View of Psychotherapy. Um, the last time we read, we read until page 178, Social Implications, in the section on a philosophy of a person uh, to be the self which one truly is. So we're going to continue on from there um, and complete this chapter. And then, um, and then in the next reading, we'll move on to the next chapter. So social implications. Let me turn for a moment to some of the social implications of the path I have attempted to describe. I have presented it as a direction which seems to have great meaning for individuals. Does it have, could it have any meaning or significance for groups or organizations? Would it be a direction which might usefully be chosen by a labor union, a church group? an industrial corporation, a university, a nation. To me, it seems like this might be possible. Let us take a look, for example, at the conduct of our own country in its foreign affairs. By and large, we find if we listen to the statements of our leaders during the past several years and read their documents that our diplomacy is always based upon high moral purposes that is always consistent with the policies we have followed previously that it involves no selfish desires and that it has never been mistaken in its judgment and choices. I think perhaps you will agree with me that if we heard an individual speaking in these terms, we would recognize at once that this must be a facade, that such statements could not possibly represent the real process going on within himself. Suppose we speculate for a moment as to how we, as a nation, might, might present ourselves in our foreign diplomacy if we were open, openly, knowingly, and acceptingly being what we truly are. I do not know precisely what we are, but I suspect that if we were trying to express ourselves as we are, then our communications with foreign countries would contain less elements of this sort. We as a nation are slowly realizing our enormous strength and the power and responsibility which go with that strength. We are moving somewhat ignorantly and clumsily toward accepting a position of responsible world leadership. We make many mistakes. We are often inconsistent. We are far from perfect. We are deeply frightened by the strength of communism, a view of life different from our own, we feel extremely competitive toward commun uh, communism, and we are angry and humiliated when the Russians surpass us in any field. We have some very selfish foreign interests, such as the oil in the Middle East. On the other hand, we have no desire to hold dominion over peoples. We have complex and contradictory feelings toward the freedom and independence and self-determination of individuals and countries. We desire these and are proud of the past support we have given to such tendencies, and yet we are often frightened by what they may mean. We tend to value and respect the dignity and worth of each individual, yet we are frightened. We, when we are frightened, we move away from this direction. Suppose we presented ourselves in, such, in some such fashion, openly and transparently in our foreign relations. We would be attempting to be the nation which we truly are in all our complexity and even contradictoriness. What would be the results? To me, the results would be similar to the experiences of a client when he is more truly that which he is. Look, let us look at some of the probable outcomes. We would be much more comfortable because we would have nothing to hide. We would focus on the problem at hand rather than spending our en energies to prove that we are moral or consistent. We could use all of our creative imagination in solving the problem rather than in defending ourselves. We could openly advance both our selfish interests and our sympathetic concern for others and let these conflicting desires find the balance which is acceptable to us as people. We could freely change and grow in our leadership position because we would not be bound by rigid concepts of what we have been, must be, or ought to be. 
we would find that we were much less feared because others would be much less inclined to suspect what lies behind the facade. We would, by our own openness, tend to bring forth openness and realism on the part of others. We would tend to work out solutions of world problems on the basis of the real issues involved, rather than in terms of the facades being worn by negotiating parties. In short, what I am suggesting by this fantasied example that nations and organizations might discover, as have individuals, that it is a richly rewarding experience to be what one deeply is. I am suggesting that this view contains the seeds of a philosophical approach to all of life, that it is more than the trend observed in the experiences of clients. Summary. I began this talk with the question each individual asks himself, what is the goal, the purpose of my life? I have tried to tell you what I have learned from my clients who in the therapeutic relationship with its freedom from, from threat and freedom of choice exemplify in their lives a commonality of direction and goal. I have pointed out that they tend to move away from self-concealment, away from being away from being the expectation of others. The characteristic movement I have said is for the client to permit himself freely to be the changing fluid process, which he is. He moves also toward a friendly openness to what is going on within him, learning to listen sensitively to himself. This means that he is increasingly a harmony of complex sensing and reactions, rather than being clarity and, simpli and simplicity of rigidity. It means that as he moves toward acceptance of of the is of the isness of himself, he accepts others increasingly in the same listening, in the same listening, understanding way. He trusts and values the complex inner processes of himself as they emerge toward expression. He is creatively realistic and realistically creative. He finds that to be this process in himself is to maximize the rate of change and growth in himself. He is continually engaged in discovering that to be all of himself in his fluid sense is not synonymous with being evil or uncontrolled. It is instead to feel a growing pride in being a sensitive, open, realistic, inner directed member of the human species, adapting with courage and imagination to the complexities of the changing situation. It means taking continual steps toward being in awareness and in expression, that which is congruent with one's total organic reactions. To use Kierkegaard's more aesthetically satisfying terms, it means to be that self which one truly is. I trust I have made it evident that this is not an easy direction to move, nor one which is ever completed. It is a continuing way of life. In trying to explore the limits of such a concept, I have suggested that this direction is not a way which is necessarily limited to clients in therapy, nor to individuals seeking to find purpose in life. It would seem to make the kind of sense for a group, an organization, or a nation, and would seem to have the same kind of rewarding concomitants. I recognize quite clearly that this pathway of life which I have outlined is a value choice, which is decidedly a variance with the goals usually chosen or behaviorally followed. Yet because it springs from individuals who have more than the usual freedom to choose and, and because it seems to express a unified trend in these individuals, I offer it to you for consideration. End of chapter. And so next time we will start with chapter nine, in a philosophy of persons, um, a therapist's view of the good life, the fully functioning person. So thank you. And I look forward to having you join us next time.